Hello, Church. The story of the temptation of Jesus is fascinating for a lot of reasons. It's one of the few stories that can be found in all four Gospels. But more than likely, when you think of the story, you probably remember Matthew, Luke, or John, and not the Gospel of Mark. And I don't blame you for that. Matthew, Luke, and John all provide a detailed account of the temptation of Jesus, while Mark only simply announces that Jesus was tempted. In Mark, this story is arguably not even a story, but a side note. Nonetheless, there is much we can learn from the simplicity of how Mark tells the story of the temptation of Jesus, which I will read for you now. The word of the Lord from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. If you blink, you might have missed it. It's only a couple of verses. And to fit it into any context, you end up having to read it as almost the extended ending to the story of the baptism of Jesus. But don't make the mistake of jumping too quickly over to another gospel to read a different version just yet. Generally speaking, Mark tells a shorter version of just about every story about Jesus. He doesn't really start elaborating on much of anything until you get to the crucifixion. And then things finally start to slow down. And I say slow down because if you take the time to read the Gospel of Mark straight through, you'll notice he likes to say certain phrases over and over again. Phrases like immediately, and then, or afterward. And it gives the impression that the years of ministry of Jesus took place over just a, a few days. But when you get to Jerusalem and the story of the crucifixion, Mark slows down, drawing attention to that particular moment of Jesus' life as a pinnacle or denouement moment of the gospel. We would be wise, however, not to rush too quickly with Mark through stories like The Temptation. There is a certain kind of clarity to be had in the short telling of Mark's version of The Temptation. So often, when we read Matthew, Luke, or John's version, we get bogged down in the depth of the details. Our minds wander in a bunch of different directions all at once. We wonder what order did the temptations present themselves to Jesus? Or are these three temptations archetypes for all temptation? Did Satan physically manifest himself to Jesus? Or were these temptations more like how we experience temptation? And each of these rabbit holes are worthy excursions for study. And we can learn and grow much from following these questions to wherever they lead. Just not in Mark. In Mark, there are no details to distract or detract from the plotline, and plotline is really all we have. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Jesus was tempted, period. Actually tempted. It wasn't a pretend show or formality. He was tempted. He weighed his options, and he found appeal in what Satan was offering. He was tempted. God made flesh experienced one of the most devastating parts of being a human, just like we do. And he was able to resist and come through it as an empathetic example for all of us. So that we can know it was possible to face our temptations, to resist them, and survive them. And there is no unfair advantage because Jesus is God. Otherwise, it would not have been tempting. And this is the reason that I appreciate Mark's simplicity. There's no escaping or distracting from the abrupt reality of the truth that Jesus was tempted. No details to get lost in, no discrepancies to argue over, just the story. And we accept this truth in a vulnerable simplicity. We can say that Jesus was tempted without a hint of scandal or doubt 
or a southern whisper. We are okay with Jesus being tempted. And we kind of like the relatability of the experience. So often the things that Jesus does leaves him feeling distant. But for him to be tempted makes him relatable. And we praise Jesus for fighting his temptations and not succumbing to them. But that's not typically how we react to temptation in other scenarios. Whether that's a neighbor, a friend in your small group, that one person that confesses their temptations before the whole church, or a co-worker, or someone who doesn't even believe in Jesus, or perhaps especially even yourself. When anyone besides Jesus is tempted, we tend to react differently. Shame and guilt kick in with a paralyzing strength, and if we are not able to rein that in, we quickly find ourselves in a place of judgment, treating others or ourselves as if temptation is the same as the sin itself. And once we know someone's temptation, it can be difficult not to label or define them by their temptation. But that is dehumanizing and just plain wrong. And we certainly wouldn't do that to Jesus. We don't read the temptation of Jesus and then remember him always as Jesus the tempted, or Jesus the almost idolater, or Jesus the gluttonous, or doubting Jesus. But for whatever reason, we have trained ourselves to identify everyone who isn't Jesus by their sin and temptation. And here's why that's not okay. And here's why we need Mark's simplicity to understand. Jesus was tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. And if Jesus can be tempted, anyone can. So it's absurd to think of labeling or judging Jesus for his temptations. So why would we do that to others? And if we are content to acknowledge the temptation of Jesus, could we not also extend the same understanding to everyone else and to ourselves? But if we continue to let our shame and our guilt oppress us, then our temptations have already gotten the better of us. Even Jesus wasn't tempted alone. God's angels were there waiting on him. God's word empowered him, and God's spirit went with Jesus into the temptation. And God's spirit and word and presence is with us and everyone else in the trenches of their temptation as well. Temptation in an isolation chamber is a fight that ends before it begins. But temptation in the presence of God, with the help of God, is a battle we can endure. Jesus was tempted. And so am I. So are you. So is everyone. But that temptation does not define us. God defines us. And like Jesus, we are God's children, and we face our temptations empowered by God. So let us no longer treat our temptations as some sort of assured sin, burying ourselves and one another in guilt and shame. Instead, let us trust in God and lean on one another so that we might face our temptations together. Instead of defining somebody by what they might do, let us learn to love them the way that God has already chosen to love them, extending a grace and a mercy that we have been given. And I think this is why it's also important to remember Mark's emphasis on forgiving others. Forgiveness is a big component of Mark. And throughout the Gospels, we are told and taught to forgive as we have been forgiven. And I think there's something to be said in learning and training ourselves to extend the a grace and mercy that we've been shown, especially in the face of temptation. And rather than assuming in some sort of strange theological manifest destiny that temptation always makes somebody sin, that it's an impossible battle, we could learn something from the example of Jesus. And rather than shying away from that in guilt and shame, if we learn how to confess those temptations and to lean on one another and to trust the empowerment of God, we can come through the desert of temptation the same way that Jesus did. So Mark tells a short story, but a good one. Jesus was tempted. We all are. It's a universal experience. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But let us not allow those temptations to become masters over us. As Paul reminds us, we cannot serve two masters. We cannot be a slave to both sin and Jesus. 
we have to choose. And there's power in that choice. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may God make God's face to shine upon you and give you peace. Peace.